we will have no other king but King Jesus. Now, I would ask you to stand and honor the reading of God's word, but I know we're in kind of close pack here, and I just want to tell you that uh, don't think I'm only picking on you because when I speak at atheist groups occasionally, not too often, but occasionally, I ask them to stand in honor of the reading of God's word too. And you know what they do? They stand up. Interesting. So, from Joshua chapter 4, the King James Version, it came to pass, when all the people who were clean passed over Jordan, that the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Take you twelve men out of the people, out of every tribe a man, and command ye them, saying, Take ye hence out of the midst of Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet had stood firm, twelve stones, and ye shall carry them over with you, and leave them in the lodging place where ye shall lodge this night. Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had prepared of the children of Israel, out of every tribe a man. And Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God in the midst of Jordan, and take you up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder, according unto the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you, that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean ye by these stones? Then ye shall answer them that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it passed over Jordan. And the waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. In Proverbs chapter 6, verse 22, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old he will not depart from it. Now let's just say my election day sermon, and those were usually at least two hours in 1775, but not to worry here today. I'll get this in in less time than that. Okay. And I stand before you as a leader of the 21st century black robe regiment, like the colonial clergy who led from the pulpit and on the field in our war for American independence. And by the way, I believe that's a war that has really never ended. It continues on. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, at verse 17, it says, Now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Now, my encouragement to us here today, you might say, is why remembering is so important and what to remember first. Now, we have an example set for us today because today is actually Armed Forces Day. On August 31st, 1949, Lewis Johnson, who was the United States Secretary of Defense, announced the creation of an Armed Forces Day to replace separate Army, Navy, and Air Force days. The event stemmed from the Armed Forces unification of one department under the Department of Defense. The Army, Navy, and Air Force leagues adopted the newly formed day. And what branch of service decided to keep their own? The Marine Corps. Uh, Marine Corps League declined to drop support for Marine Corps Day, or Marine uh, Corps Day was basically what they called it, but supports Armed Forces Day too. Now the first Armed Forces Day was celebrated on Saturday, May 20th, 1950. The theme for that day was Team for Defense, which expressed the unification of all military forces under one government department. According to the U.S. Department of Defense, the day was designed to expand public understanding of what type of job was performed and the role of the military in civilian life. Armed Forces Day was a day for the military to show state-of-the-art equipment to Americans. It was also a day for honor and acknowledge Americans in the armed forces. Parades, open houses, receptions, and air shows were held at the inaugural Armed Forces Day. Armed Forces Day is still celebrated nationwide today and is part of Armed Forces Week. Certain types of music are also played at Armed Forces Day events, including at memorials and cemeteries, as a way to respect those in the armed forces who died for their country. For example, buglers have played a bugle call known as simply taps. By the way, there's going to be a quiz after this. Always is. Taps is usually sounded by the United States military at events such as flag ceremonies, 
memorial services and funerals. Day is gone, gone the sun, from the lake, from the hills, from the sky. All is well, safely rest, God is nigh. Fading light dims the sight, and a star gems the sky, gleaming bright. From afar, drawing nigh, falls the night. Thanks and praise for our days, neath the sun, neath the stars, neath the sky. As we go, this we know, God is nigh. The sun has set, shadows come, time has fled, scouts must go to their beds, always true to the promise that they made. While the light fades from sight, all the stars gleaming rays softly send, to thy hands we are souls, Lord command. So why is remembering so important? And what to remember first? That's certainly one thing. Your courage, your steadfastness, is the backbone of Americans' influence for peace around the world. What is usually said as thanks to those that have served in uniform. And we have not because we ask not. And I can tell you I have certainly learned the necessity in my life of asking God for wisdom, for guidance, and for help, as we read in Scripture in James chapter 1, verse 5. The one thing I am absolutely sure of, and I believe that our patriot ancestors certainly understood this very well, there is a God. I am not him, you are not him, and they understood that they weren't God either, and they called upon him. Now, one of my favorite people, and I was awarded the Patriot Award, some of you in this room have had it before, if you look on that Patriot Award, it has an effigy, if you will, of Douglas MacArthur, who was one of my favorites. He addressed the Massachusetts State Legislature in Boston on July 25, 1951. He said this, I find in existence a new and here for unknown and dangerous concept that members of our armed forces owe primary allegiance and loyalty to those who temporarily exercise the authority of the executive branch of government rather than to the country and its constitution, which they are sworn to defend. Daniel Webster, great man that he was, said this, God grants liberty only to those who love it and are always ready to guard and defend it. The only foundation of a free constitution is pure virtue. And if this cannot be inspired into our people in a greater measure than they have it now, they may change their rulers and the forms of government, but they will not obtain the lasting liberty. And that was said in 1776 by John Adams. So when you're thinking all is lost here in America, remember that they were facing some of the similar circumstances that we are facing today. John Witherspoon, 1776. Does anybody know that name? And what one of the most important things that he did in his life was? He signed the Declaration of American Independence. He said, nothing is more certain than a, that a general profligacy and corruption of manners make a people ripe for destruction. A good form of government may hold the rotten materials together for some time, but beyond a certain pitch, even the best constitution will be ineffectual and slavery must ensue. It's necessary for every American with becoming energy to endeavor to stop the dissemination of principles evidently destructive of the cause for which they have bled. And that from the wonderful woman, Mercy Otis Warren in 1805. So why is remembering so important? And what to remember first? If you love wealth better than liberty, the tranquility of servitude better than the animating contest of freedom, go home from us in peace. We seek not your council of arms. Crouch down and lick the hands which feed you. May your chains set lightly upon you, and may posterity forget that you were our countrymen. And that, of course, was from Samuel Adams at the Philadelphia State House, August 1st, 1776. The time is now near at hand, which must probably determine whether Americans are to be free men or slaves, whether they are to have property that they can call their own, whether their houses and farms are to be pillaged and destroyed, and if they consign to a state of wretchedness 
from which no human efforts will probably deliver them. The fate of unborn millions will now depend, under God, on the courage and conduct of this army. Our cruel and unrelenting enemy leaves us no choice but a brave resistance or the most abject submission. We have, therefore, to resolve to conquer or die. Our own country's honor calls upon us for a vigorous and manly exertion. And if now shamefully fail, we shall become infamous to the whole world. Let us rely upon the goodness of the cause and the aid of the supreme being, in whose hands victory is, to animate and encourage us to great and noble actions. The eyes of all our countrymen are now upon us, and we have their blessing and praises. If happily we are the instruments of saving them, the tyranny meditated and mediated against them. Let us animate and encourage each other on his own ground is superior to any slavish mercenary on earth. And that came from George Washington to the American Army from the Orderly Book, July 2nd, 1776. And of course, I remind you, anyone that's wearing uh, the SAR insignia of George Washington's personage on there. So why is remembering so important? And what to remember first? The establishment of civil and religious liberty was the motive which induced me to the field. The object is attained and is now remains to be my earnest wish and prayer that the citizens of the United States could make a wise and virtuous use of the blessings placed before them. And that was said by George Washington in 1783. Nevertheless, to the persecution and tyranny of this cruel ministry, we will not tamely submit. Appealing to heaven for the justice of our cause, we determined to die or to be free. That was said by Joseph Warren, April 26, 1775, and you know that he was murdered in a sense and very poorly treated at Bunker Hill. Great man that he was. So why is remembering so important and what to remember first? When we assumed the soldier, we did not lay aside the citizen. And we shall most sincerely rejoice with you in the happy hour when the establishment of American liberty upon the most firm and solid foundation shall enable us to return to our private stations in the bosom of a free, <coughs> peaceful, and happy country. And that was from George Washington, 1775. <coughs> so why remembering is so important? And what to remember first? And by now, I'm sure that you have come up with an answer or two to that question or those questions. And if you'll just indulge me just a couple of moments more, uh, I want to give you a couple of answers at least. First of all, we must, as our ancestors did, bring our needs to God Almighty, the true God, appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions. This is a prayer. Amen. It's not unconstitutional, by the way, to pray. Though some people will tell you that it is. And by the way, I've just quoted part of the Declaration of American Independence, one of the finest documents ever in the history of this world, bar none. Not on the equivalent of the Holy Scriptures, but certainly one of the most important documents. And I can tell you, just as a little aside, years ago, uh, a pastor came from Kenya, and he wanted to bring the Patriot pastor to Kenya. I said, why do you want the American Patriot pastor to come to Kenya? He said, well, in Kenya, we have many Christians, but we do not have a constitution. We do not have a Declaration of American Independence, and I know you're very expert on that, and I think you need to go and tell people how much of a benefit that would be to our country. Unfortunately, many of our countrymen do not see these things as benefits, but on my watch, while I still have breath in my body, I will not stop saying these things anywhere that I go. And secondly, we must know what we are about. It's our duty to teach these American original intentions, morals, and service to our children, grandchildren, and to this constitutional republic, what our ancestors prayed, paid, fought, suffered, bled, and died for. And of course, the choice of scripture that I had in the beginning uh, was to remind you that God had given that as an edict, if you will, as a command not a suggestion, and by the way, the Ten Commandments were not a suggestion, they were commandments. 
And he told the Israelites, you will teach your children this. You will have these stones of remembrance so that they will remember the things that's important. And then finally, our beloved ancestors are not here now. Think about that. I think about it often, being here right now on the Cape, about my, my grandparents who lived here, or when I'm in Lexington and so many of my ancestors are buried there. We stopped at the cemetery yesterday and had a salute. My father was a decorated Second World War veteran. My grandfather was a decorated First World War veteran. Uh, so we stopped there at the cemetery and I thought about, okay, I hope that they would be proud of me, what I'm doing. because. For us, in this society particularly, our beloved ancestors aren't here to do the job anymore. We are. We're here, so it's up to us to fight on. And just like you'll see on Lexington Green when you look up, they'll say the cradle of American liberty, and people will say it's a shot heard round the world. Well, the shot is still being heard round the world about the true America. So I conclude with this saying, God bless these states of America united. God bless us as sons of the American Revolution, as people who should know what it is that our ancestors fought for, many who died, and many who lived on who were crippled or had lost considerably. We need to understand what that is. So God bless America and God bless you all. Thank you. <laughs>